Hello and welcome to the Omnia Performance Podcast. Um, I'm your host and uh, Fergus is not here, so this is all you get today. Uh, I hope, uh, hope nobody hangs up and presses stop now. Um, I'm not on my own, though. I'm going to be joined by uh, our friend and coach, uh, James Blanchard, who I'll uh, introduce in just a moment. Before we do that, uh, it's worth going through the usual uh, kit and caboodle here, getting through the, uh, the uh, subscribe, please hit this button, hit that button, make sure and review, make sure and leave comments, do all the nice things that podcast listeners know they should do to keep their, uh, their wonderful experience continuing and, uh, and, and please show us that love. Um, anybody who watches this regularly will know that I have no idea what number we're on, but this is number two with James. Um, so I'm very excited to welcome James back uh, for a very pointed conversation today, which we'll get into in a minute. But first of all, hello, James. Hello, Johnny. How's it going? It's good, mate. It's good. Uh, it's very good in here. Um, I've got a whole lot of space. Look, Love it. Love it. <laughs> anybody anybody who's, who's watching this on YouTube will know that normally uh, Fergus and I are shoulder to shoulder, but it's a little bit like in films when people talk to each other. The reality is you are literally shoulder to shoulder. So I'm, uh, I'm spreading out. I've got one leg akimbo over here and I'm, I'm just uh, using up all the, all the unnecessary space. Um, the last time we talked, uh, we had a kind of a bit of an introduction to who JB was and, and, and a little bit about... Um, how you've arrived uh, at Omnia and, and, and your own experience as, as a hybrid athlete, uh, uh, a noted hybrid athlete in my mind, and, and, uh, and a hybrid coach. Uh, but what we didn't get into uh, was something that uh, I think a lot of listeners will be interested in, which is uh, something that you do that, that I've never done. Uh, so I'm very interested to kind of get into the nitty gritty with you. Uh, as well as remote coaching, which is something that we specialize in, uh, this online coaching, uh, you also run a gym, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, you run uh, two gyms, yes? That is absolutely um, correct. Uh, so you have a bricks and mortar presence. Uh, uh, I, I feel like I've said that so many times that now it doesn't make sense, but I'm sure it does to anybody listening. Uh, you have uh, a place, uh, two places that, that uh, you operate uh, coaching out of and you look after other coaches in. Uh, and although that would seem obvious in a certain sense for a coach well yes where do you train i think it's fair to say that most coaches uh, tend to train at other people's gyms or, or maybe have a private studio or maybe uh, do do what we're doing and kind of operate online nowadays that's, that's something that's relatively new but relatively uh, uh, universal now i think um what i'd like you to do today or us to do through this conversation is just chat about some of the the uh so, some of the experiences that you've had in setting that up and, and how you came to that and uh, just a little bit more about what that means to be to be the owner of a gym and uh, uh, and all that goes with it, good and the bad, the rough and the smooth. So first of all, easy question for you to answer. Where Where is your gym? What's it called? Tell us a little bit more about uh, uh, that that uh, place, those places that you have. Sure. So uh, first off, thanks for having me on again. Um, so my or our two gyms, who I, I co-own with my business partner Joe, we are based in Seven Oaks in Kent, um, and we have two properties um, that are about two miles, mile and a half apart. Um, we started out with one back in two thousand nineteen, had a excellent start, and then um, COVID hmm. happened, um, and. Uh, to, to be fair, we, we did we did pretty well. We kind of uh, pivoted onto to online coaching and then we opened our second gym in 2021 in the summer. Mm -hmm. And those gyms, like you say, the proximity to them is actually quite close, isn't it? So you're, you're looking at, um, uh, presumably, uh, you, were, you were just trying to create a larger footprint in, in the same area in order to facilitate the need that, that you had created, correct? Exactly. I mean, we, we were having this conversation off air earlier, weren't we? Yeah. Talking about how, um, and I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll go on to talk about this in a bit more detail, but when you want to grow and you might want to open a bigger premises or whatever, obviously you have to have availability of, of such a thing. And um, unfortunately, we, we couldn't find somewhere that was um, a bigger space. So we uh, we just opened another gym. So <laughs> we're kind of one, one, one such solution for, for lack of availability. You get shuttle buses between in case you want to go from one bit of kit to the other. Hey, oh, I'm sorry, exactly, the exactly. Actually, gym number two, you're going to have to. Yeah, <laughs> see, you, see you up there. there. <laughs> so, before we came on, there was something I was chatting about, uh, which uh, which you were nodding about, and uh, I think it's fair to say that that 
any aspiring coach kind of has a, a little bit of a daydream about what would be the perfect scenario for them. Um, uh, one of those, uh, and, and I fell into, still sometimes fall into that kind of uh, uh, daydreamy trap of, of, of thinking, wouldn't it be wonderful to own my own gym? Uh, uh, what did I say before? It, it, it would be a wonderful place. I can train whenever I like. It's going to be sexy. It's going to look better than any other gym. Uh, and uh, everybody will come and it will just be like uh, uh, living in a, in a massive uh, gym style playground. Uh, I'm going to assume that that uh, is uh, to a degree what I'm going to assume that that's where you you were in the first place with it, in the sense that you you may have been thinking, in fact, why don't you tell me what led you to the point where you thought before you've even opened it, what led you to the point where you were saying, I, I would like to have a gym? I mean, to be honest, initially it was um, it was more a case of just wanting to earn, earn more money, like being more successful business wise um, and perhaps like a call it arrogance or whatever you want to chalk it up to, but thinking like, right, where I'm working now, I think I could do better or I could do it differently and be successful. It's, it's, it's maybe a better, ambition, uh, James. Uh, yeah, exactly. And maybe, maybe I'm, I need to cut myself some slack, but yeah, yeah I, I think in, in the first instance, that's how it was all kind of born and the, and the idea came about. Um, and then of course, one thing led to another and you kind of, you, you position yourself in the market a little bit better as well. So yeah. I noticed that there was a bit of a niche of, um, actual trainers being underserved in the in kind of like the market. So rather than like okay. traditionally, you think in a gym, you'd be like, well, your your members, your PT clients are are your customers. But I kind of came at a bit more of a different angle, thinking actually I want to be able to better serve trainers. Okay. Um, so ultimately, I'm perhaps jumping the gun a little bit talking about that, but that's kind of where it where it led on to. Okay. But that was that was your idea in the first place is that you wanted somewhere that, that, that would facilitate what you might want as, as, a, as a, a personal trainer and as a coach uh, that you weren't seeing was uh, was being facilitated elsewhere. Exactly. Um, going back to my daydream, uh, the the idea in your head is that you would get to do all those things I said, which is this kind of playground fantasy that, you you, you know, you, you're in, you can just throw down, do some Olympic lifting, have a nice coffee and everything, everybody's jacked and having fun. Um, but the reality, I'm assuming, uh, because of the nature of business, and actually you, you alluded it to it earlier on, the uh, the break in service that you must have had to go, on th go through with the, uh, the the pandemic, et cetera, I'm assuming it's very different to that fantasy. Can you, I don't want to labor too much on, well, actually, I think we should probably dig into it in a very real sense and, and talk through the kind of pain points, but how do you go from the idea I would like to own a gym to owning a gym. What's, what's the first things that you would need to do? Do you think? Yeah. So I, I think like before we go on, it's might be a good idea to kind of caveat that we'll talk a lot about like the pitfalls and the mistakes mm -hmm. and stuff, which yeah. I think can paint the picture has been overwhelmingly negative, but <laughs> that's not, that's not the intention at all. I think like it's been a very rewarding and on the whole positive experience, but I think also it's, it's worth kind of, um, bearing a few things in mind which presented themselves as you know obstacles with me going through this process and stuff where i screwed up where i wish obviously i hadn't but it's given me before, these these sorry go on well just before you carry on mate and, and, and i like where you're going with it because i think we we do need to open those pitfalls up and say to people these, these these are where the traps are but did you have anybody giving you that or were you were you winging it at this point yeah so i am um, with my first studio, so I, I was um, I was a trainer at a, a real kind of um, well, just it was a big facility, like yeah. I think maybe like twelve thousand square feet. Okay. Um, so I broke away from that first, basically because an opportunity was presented to me to open my own studio, and I thought, as I alluded to earlier, you know what, I want to want to give this a go, um, yeah. and I think if I hadn't have had that little gentle kind of nudge of encouragement pushing me in the right direction. I probably wouldn't have um, wouldn't have gone through um, through with it. So, or kind of pretty much every step of the way, there's been some degree of kind of guidance, whether that's more in like a a mentorship capacity, or okay. um, guidance from some other professionals. Like, even though you know when you open a gym, you don't think of having to deal with solicitors, accountants, because you you perhaps in the first instance perceive it as being all quite dull. You know, like mm -hmm. I don't work behind a desk. I'm on the gym floor doing my thing. But actually, yeah. these people provide some absolutely valuable resources, advice, um, which, to be honest, you'd be you'd be pretty stupid to kind of um, not take into account their expertise and guidance. 
I don't. Yeah, I'd agree. Hundred percent would agree. But I think probably you would agree with this that it's not uh, not arrogance to think. Uh, oh, I don't need all that. It's probably, uh, uh, for want of a better word, ignorance. You know, you. you're gonna Yeah, yeah. Think to yourself, that's, that's definitely a better way of putting it. Yeah, you're going to think to yourself, well, I'm going to. I'm going to open a gym. I'm going to serve people. They just need to come in. They need to train. They need to get, you know, pay me and, and, and I'll pay the bills. You know, what, why would I need all these other people? But, um, yeah, I guess reality bites hard, doesn't it? When, when, when you, when you dig into these things, you think, Oh God, because I cannot spin all those plates and why would I want to, I want to, I want to coach people. Correct. For sure. Yeah. And I, and I think to that point, you do have to kind of concede that you are going to have to step away from that side of things a bit. Um, yeah. But that, that was kind of always one big thing that I, I didn't want to completely give up. Like, first and foremost, I want to be a coach. I don't want to be a gym owner. Well, I do want to be a gym owner, but not as my primary yeah. kind of day job. Because um, so coaching it facilitates it. the coaching, correct? Yeah, it, exactly. Exactly. And I think that's what um, kind of led to the idea of, of being able to like offer this kind of facility for other trainers to be able to, to do the same thing. Uh-huh. Um, you know, being able to actually make a good living from it be able to have enough space to actually coach your clients and that kind of thing. Yeah. So let's go back to the pitfalls and I cut you off. Uh, apologies again. Um, no, no, no. The, the, uh, what, what are the, the main kind of traps or pitfalls or, or, or issues that you came across? Um, maybe some that would seem blindingly obvious now, but there's better to be things that you think, Oh my God, why did I not think of that? Take us through some of those moments. Yeah, yeah, of course. So I think, um, first and foremost, probably, I would say the understanding the startup cost fully. Mm. So it is expensive. Like if you've ever been to a, a great gym, so like I'll use my university gym as an example. So at the age of 18, I walked into this gym that had Elico barbells, plates, Elico branded platforms and racks. And it had a plyometric area. Like if you're, if you're into this kind of thing as, as much as I am, this was like, heaven right yeah, yeah. however it turns out I, that I, kind I of shit is, i can see it <laughs> <laughs> it turns out that kind of stuff's really expensive so um <laughs> even um even if you're leasing this kit renting it the you still need to put down some initial um kind of um deposits on it mm-hmm. and same as well for if you if you're taking on a lease you're gonna you the um the person who's gonna be renting out the premises to you is gonna need some level of security you're gonna have to put up probably at least three months of rent up front. So I think all of this kind of stuff, um, you, it's just not clear until you put yourself through this process where you think, oh, actually, yeah, shit, this is a lot of money. Yeah, um, yeah. So being able to kind of budget for all that kind of stuff is is absolutely essential. And I think also giving yourself a little bit of, of room for error as well. So yeah. when we... Uh, when we first got going, we had stuff that was um put in our way which we'd never even heard of before so um acoustic surveyors were involved because we had people living upstairs and they were worried that there was going to be noise of course from barbells yeah. people jumping on the floor blah 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 so anyway that involved a, a great sum of money and we could only proceed on the condition that we had these stupidly expensive mats and it turned out the matting was like the number one cost of actually opening the bloody place and yeah. we yeah, never you- would have thought that yeah, you first think it would be the, the it's an, even that is interesting uh, for, from a from an external perspective because although whilst I can conceive of it now as you lay that out, uh, that wouldn't be the first thing either I would have thought of. Although I have have experienced other people opening gyms and 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 yeah, I've seen firsthand that God, I didn't think this would be the most expensive thing, but you know, yeah, yeah, matting. You would think it's going to be that illegal bar or that sexy platform or that plyometric area and all the rest of it. And then you, you find exactly. it. Exactly. It's just, it's just the bloody flooring before you even get that stuff in. So. Exactly. So yeah, those, those kind of things, it was, um, yeah, you, n- nothing could have prepared us for it other than just going through the process, but you can be prepared to be surprised <laughs> somewhat <laughs> by, apply, by applying a little kind of stress testing your budget a little bit more and thinking, right, if whatever is going to cost 50% more, is that going to put me in a hole? Is it going to stop me from actually being able to um, uh, hit the ground running anyway? Um, and all of, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, and you had to find that out the hard way, did you? That, uh, you know, okay, this is our budget. And now, now the budget is extraordinary because the flooring has to be injected with some special powder that stops your barbell screaming at the, at the upstairs, upstairs neighbours. Great. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, presumably as well, James, when, when you open somewhere, 
So, so this is business, isn't it, in, in, in any sense? That you, you're going to have to tell people you're there and why you're there and what it is that you're doing. You, you touched on earlier on the idea that you you wanted not only to provide somewhere where people could come and be coached, but you wanted to provide somewhere where, where good coaches were, were being looked after and, and their operational capability, their, their coaching capability was being nurtured somewhat. And is that something that you saw as being a, a, a business plan, something to separate you or, or something just in your head? Did you, how did you how did you identify to people that this is where you wanted to go with it? And did you did you even do that? Yeah, so, I mean, it was having that um, awareness that I need to have some sort of niche. So if I was moving away from that massive facility um, into my first version of my studio was literally a room above a Botox clinic. Okay. It was tiny yeah so in order to actually have something that would attract people to to, to go there and um, i had to be able to kind of like target those people as a niche and be able to serve them appropriately so really, that's not why you grew that mustache though no uh, no no exactly not this i can definitely <laughs> say on the uh, midnight first of uh, december this is coming off but, um so um yes um where was i <laughs> sorry mate. So, no no no, no, no. i'm only messing so yeah being able to actually like serve that niche was incredibly yeah. important and identifying that niche as well so the um for us or for, for myself initially it, i was kind of thinking like right the, at the moment, I've just got myself and my and my existing clients kind of coming in, but I knew I wanted it to be something bigger. And I did think, well, actually, do you know what? I know that in this area, we're we're lucky to live in in quite like an affluent area where personal training is very much like a thing. Mm -hmm. There's so many gyms around, but the what I felt because I was in the same position that trainers weren't being paid particularly well, and in exchange for not particularly brilliant pay, I also found that actually like the the facility to training wasn't quite up to snuff either in terms of even just having access to space. And um, mm -hmm. so I thought, right, that's the, that's the area I want to go down. I knew there was tons of people like me and then ultimately managed to find enough um, customers or, or trainers to, to kind of uh, join with me in this first version of our, of our bigger PT studio. And then, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of what initially got it going. And was a lot of that, uh, uh, you know, conceptually in, in your mind, as you've just described, or did you, uh, I'm presuming you, you also went out there after you'd had that idea and did some kind of market research, like, okay, this sounds nice in my head, but are people going to be interested? Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I definitely put the, um, put the feelers out. So I spoke to uh, quite a few colleagues and friends who, who are trainers or were trainers. Um, and then of course, from that, it just became a, a case of like, right, is this a, is this a possibility? Mm -hmm. So I, I spoke earlier about um, kind of the importance of having like a bit of mentorship and guidance. So yeah. my I'm very lucky to have um, my landlord who is a client and a friend. So he basically said, look, I've got this opportunity to um, take over a space, get it up to up to scratch. The place was an absolute hole to begin with. And um, it hadn't been um, it hadn't been used for 15, 20 years. It okay. was the basement was flooded. But anyway, he bought his place and said, right, um, I'm going to, as I say, get this up to scratch, get this up to standard. Would you like it as a gym? So then that kind of gave me an opportunity to think, actually, yeah, do you know what? This could work. So I kind of did my best to, to kind of crunch numbers, see if it could work. And then once I decided that actually this niche is present, I could uh, give it a go. And your man there with with the, uh, the hovel that he offered you, uh, I'm going to guess that he... I'm joking, of course, but I'm going to guess that he also came armed with a, a wealth of experience in terms of the things that you had been talking about earlier on. The the uh, listen, James, you're going to have to think about an acoustic, uh, you know, because we've got something upstairs, and you're going to uh, what did you call it, an acoustic review or something? And, yeah, uh, acoustic surveyor. Yeah, surveyor. The, the, who knew? Who knew that yeah, was a thing? Who knew exactly. But you would also then have he would be attuned quite quickly to, to other things that you're going to need on that front. For instance, just having the, the, the leisure facility license that, that uh, I guess councils would, would have you, you know, you're going to have to see what it is that your business does and then jump through some hoops in terms of health and safety and all that kind of stuff. So of course. Uh, I guess uh, right or wrong is that, that he would have been able to kind of advise you a little bit, or at least uh, give you, give you a kind of a nod in the right direction, which is bloody useful. I think. Yeah. hundred percent. I think, and even in the instance where he didn't necessarily know, what was going on, like his, his background isn't in opening gyms or anything like that, but it is in, you know, leasing out commercial property, that yeah. kind of stuff. But 
even in the instance where he wouldn't know the answer to something, he was kind of well networked enough to know someone who does know the answers. So yeah, that, that kind of thing certainly in the early days was invaluable. Yeah, yeah, I would guess so. I would guess so. Uh, going back to your niche then, and and, and this kind of marketplace uh, research that you did, um, when you when you're approaching the the trainers etc. to uh, you know, here, here's what I think would be a great working environment for you. You've obviously got to have, they are customers in a sense, because they're going to pay you um, some kind of commission in order to house them and, uh, and allow them to use your facility. But then you've got the end user as well to think of. And what I'm interested in here is that y y you said that in, in the area that you're in, there are a lot of PTs uh, and presumably a lot of gyms and, and the place, the facility you worked in, this very large facility that wasn't catering for people in the way that you you, you would like to. Um, you're up against uh, quite a lot of uh, competition there, aren't you? you you're going to need to sort of say, we are who we are, this is what we're providing, how are we going to pull you in? So as well as the marketing, I'm guessing you 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 had to kind of invest relatively heavily in advertising. I mean, to be honest, we, um, we, we rely a lot on word of mouth for that kind of thing. Okay. So we're pretty lucky where we haven't really had to do any paid advertising oh, at all, apart okay. from apart from the odd little bit to help pick up some new actual kind of um, PT clients. I suppose um, I'm or, guessing the, the, the guys that you're working with, the client, the, the PTs that you've got there, they're they're also going to have their network of of clients that they've that they've operated with, etc. So, do you exactly do you have any need? Jumping around all over the place here, James, and apologies. No, 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 it's not just the way my brain's working. Do you, do you have any need then to talk to the PTs and say that overall we would like you to offer this particular kind of service so there's some kind of continuity to the service? Or are you allowing the PTs to kind of thrive in their own niche within your uh, uh, environment? How does that work? Well, well, I think, to be honest, more of the, uh, more of the latter. So okay. the way that our... Uh, rent model works it definitely attracts more the pts who've already got a pre-existing client base so nine times out of ten that signifies that they already kind of they know what they're doing they've got their um their own methods of of working already and um, and then it's we see it as our job to actually provide the environment for as you put it just to thrive do their thing and um, so yeah that's that's typically how that's worked in the past so your customer ultimately is is the PT, as you said. It's not, not exactly, you know, and their customer is 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 their business essentially, as long as they can uh, help keep your business running. <laughs> Precisely that, and I mean to to an extent, like the lines are blurred somewhat in terms of you know we we still have to look after clients and provide a great experience for them as a facility owner, but yeah. we want to have it where you know people can come in as trainers, take autonomy, um, and and run the business within reason the way that they want to run it. And what about James? Uh, you, you earlier on we were talking about the fact that there, there are things that kind of come up and bite you. Like we'll come back to that acoustic surveyor again. Uh, but but one thing that I wouldn't have thought of uh, until I'm sitting thinking, and, and you and I had that chat before as well, is that in this facility that I've daydreamed, this fantasy facility, I'm just kicking about. I'm the king of the castle, and and, and here I am working in my own fancy gym. Uh, not not dissimilar to the one you described uh, with all the, all the mag kit everywhere, just looking beautiful. But that doesn't work like that, does it? You're going to need staff as well. There's going to need to be people that are kind of managing that or people that you're going to have to offset responsibility. Because as we said earlier on, you can't spin all those plates without a few of them crashing. Um, of course. So are you then having to to dig into this idea of maybe working with people who aren't uh, predominantly fitness industry based? So I'm thinking about maybe, I, I haven't been to your facility, so you'll have to paint the picture for me. I'm thinking maybe receptionists or you mentioned accountants and you mentioned all these other kind of facilitators of that business kind of running well How, how's that experience worked out for you sure so i mean we referring to your example of having gym managers that kind of stuff or um yeah. people just managing things who um sorry people managing things within a gym who aren't like experienced in the fitness industry so perhaps like receptionists managers that kind of thing we've managed to build a business where we in its current form doesn't really need that so that might come further down the line if we decide to open a bigger site, more okay. sites, stuff like that. But it ties in quite nicely to this whole um, thing of like proving your concept first before you go too, too big or too advanced. So yeah. we've got a small team with a couple of small gyms. We don't need those extra, or as of yet, we don't need those extra layers of complication of having managers receptionists we can have the trainers we provide a booking system the trainers can use their booking system as they wish 
um, where they kind of like deal with their own administration of clients and stuff like that. So that kind of thing um, works pretty well, but certainly sometimes it can be quite tough, like explaining to people like accountants who, um, when they're not familiar with like the business model of a gym, it's, yeah. it takes like a, a little bit of explaining to for them to kind of wrap their head around it. Um, but once they do, honestly, they're, that's the one thing I would recommend to anyone kind of starting a gym. I've had a few people who've kind of um, messaged me on Instagram or emailed me or whatever, asking financial questions. Nine times out of 10, the answer is just go see an accountant. They'll be able to, I used the term stress test earlier. They'll be able to help you stress test your, your business. And um, you'd be able to work out, um, you know, if your estimations of costs seem reasonable, they'll be able to tell you things that perhaps you've overlooked. Um, so, for example, one th- another thing that we overlooked, of which there are many, but was was business rates. Yeah. So yeah. you you guys are obviously yourself and uh, Fergus are obviously based up in Scotland, so that the the model might be a little bit different up there. But the way, um, I mean, we'd need a whole dedicated podcast and then some to actually talk about how they work out business rates. Doesn't seem to make a, a great deal of sense. But <laughs> no. it was one such thing where, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, let's let's stay clear of that. But yeah, po- point being, they ended up being a hell of a lot more than we thought they would be. Okay. Um, and I think if we'd have put a little bit more time and research and effort into finding out a little bit more about that in the in the early days, it would have um, it would have you know done us a favour to be honest. Saved you some, saved you some heartache. It, exactly. So yeah. So yeah, basically, yeah, getting expertise from other people and having people on board as you know, you might not think of, of an accountant as being part of your team, but they absolutely are. And ultimately at the end of the day, they are there to make you as tax efficient as possible to maximize your profit as much as possible. And yeah. um, so, yeah, you, you do well to think of them as a, as a team member. Yeah, no, absolutely. I f- fully get that. I think um, it's, it's an interesting aside, isn't it? That, that, uh, that, that kind of speaks to the, to the art of coaching as well, isn't it? Is that you, you, you have to recognize your, your, your expertise and your, your line of thought and your, your, um, your will to, to do a certain thing and then also recognize that there are others that have a, a scope. Like when I'm talking about referring out to physiotherapists and uh, in, in from a coaching practice or maybe psychologists, etc. Whilst you might have a kind of an attachment or an understanding of these things, better practice is actually to have other individuals that you can lean on and say, well, that's not my uh, niche. That's not my, my level of expertise only reaches X point, but I have an expert on hand who can, who can advise us all which is uh, good advice all around, I think. But there's something in the in the art of delegation uh, to, that presumably you've kind of learned along the way as well for, as, as a business owner as opposed to being a coach. Yeah, yeah of course. I think you um, you enter the process into not wanting to give up control. And I think a, a big part of that comes from from fear, right? Like sure, yeah. this is your, it's your baby. It's something that you've kind of, um, you know, you've had this, you've conceived this idea and you've seen it through into fruition and it is really difficult to, to give up control you're, you're worried that people might not do it right and that kind of stuff but ultimately that kind of attitude just holds you back you're you're never going to be um you're never going to turn it into something as big as you want to be if you just keep it to to kind of yourself you need to be yeah. able to like lean on others for expertise and um and guidance yeah i think that's good life advice as well jamie you could you could, you could take out the, the the context of this conversation and just uh, have that little snippet and you know you need to lean on others. You need to you need to understand that you can't take it all on board yourself. You can't whatever it might be. If if you're to try to do to do that, eventually you're going to get overwhelmed. That's uh, that's good business advice and good good uh, good life advice, I think as well, mate. Now, what we've done so far, uh, I don't think negative, but we've certainly leaned into the the pitfalls, the problems, the the plates, the crashing of plates, the the, the avoiding that, the learning from it, etc. But why don't we? Uh, I'm conscious of time uh, and, and and don't want to sort of uh, turn this into a, a, a ABC of how to run a gym. That's that's for people to discover uh, through different means, I think. But what I would really like you to be able to do just now, if you can, is take us through some of the some of the positives, some of the things that you have really kind of allowed you to flourish, and some of the things that, that you can take from this and, and and feel proud about. So, so what are the positives of uh, of gym ownership and business ownership from your experience? I, th- I think the um... The biggest positive, and I think you could apply this to, to more or less anything that involves a lot of work and a lot of effort, is just sitting back and taking stock of, of what you've achieved. So you started out at day dot, and then you've um, you've brought it into something you know much bigger than that, two, three, four, five, six plus years down the line. 
So that is really cool, kind of looking back and reflecting on on what you've done, what successes you've had. So thinking back to, um, you know, when I first came out of university, would have been 2011, got my first job at, at this gym, which was absolutely fantastic and was brilliant in serving a purpose. But to go from that and then now to owning two gyms myself is I'm, um, I'm really proud of myself and what like the yeah. the team, my business owner and I've, have, um, have kind of done. That's, that's what I would say like is the, is the biggest positive. Um, and I think as well is realizing not necessarily, you know, just looking at the, um, the financial incentives and success. It's also thinking, well, what, what have you actually created? You've created somewhere where other people's businesses can thrive. You've created somewhere where you, you've created somewhere where other businesses can thrive. You've created somewhere where people actively want to come and, and spend their time. And that is genuinely wonderful. And it's, it's yeah. such a huge positive. People literally want to come and spend an hour of their time with you. They might see you more um, per week than some members of their family, some of their friends. Um, and so, yeah, that genuinely is a real privilege. And, and to be honest, is one thing that keeps me coaching. And um, yeah, yeah it's, a, it's something that's really, really cool. I read an interesting thing uh, just yesterday uh, that, that crosses my mind that you're kind of covering off there is that it was a um, different different data points of who you spend your life with. Uh, and, and so, for instance, one of the data uh, measures, one of the graphs was showing that, you know, you, you'll spend time with your children up until they're, you know, X amount of age. And then that time is going to be less and less because obviously they're away finding their own lives. And one of the things was that... Um, and there was lovely lessons to be learned from these things. I won't go too deep into that, but one of the very specific things, and I think you, you can attest to this, is that if you can create an environment or, or find an environment where you are around people, your working environment, uh, where you're around people that you enjoy their presence, they, you know, there, there is positive energy being, being uh, exchanged back and forth, then actually we spend so much of our lives with people we work with, um, that it, it, it makes it so much more important when you understand that data set uh, that that's going to be so huge in your life that you want to make sure that that's right. Uh, and I think in your case, what you've described quite succinctly is having created a place where you now feel like you can go into that place and you can see uh, what good you've done. Uh, you can see what you've achieved. That ambition we talked about right at the very start has been, has been uh, uh, you know, fruitful. Um, but also, it sounds like something that you're enjoying very personally is just seeing that kind of joy facilitated. That, that That's something I enjoy about coaching is knowing that whatever you've imparted, or uh, and, and in your case, the environment that you've created and the opportunity you've created for other PTs, you can just go in, have a look around, stand for five minutes and just see that happening in front of you. That must be really, really rewarding, I would imagine. Yeah, it is, it is really, really cool. We, we always try and um, uh, foster an environment where if there's any kind of issues, trainers can talk to us. Um, anything we can like do to make their experience better. Um, we try as well to kind of, you know, we we understand that just in the same way as you get turnover of clients, like clients come and go, we're also going to get staff coming and going as well. So we've had a couple of people that have left to start their own gyms, wow. but they've been able to tell us kind of almost in the first instance of them having that idea where we can prepare for them to leave. They don't have to feel like they have to keep a secret from us or anything like that. Um, and that that has worked really nicely to kind of create a bit of a, like a, a smooth changeover, so to speak. Yeah. Um, kind of open which has been honest environment allows it, people exactly. to just, you know, not feel too beholding to you. you, you Pre yeah. Precisely. Because at the end of the day, my, myself, my business partner, we left, we left the gym, took business with us. And we can't begrudge others for wanting to do the same at the end yeah. of the day. And no matter how difficult it might make life in a business sense for us, we have to, you know, be be willing to admit that that's just a, a nature the nature of the business that we're in, yeah. Um, and yeah, just best prepare that. For, sorry, best prepare for that as uh, as well as we can. Okay, okay. So it sounds like uh, sounds like you've been successful, mate. Sounds like, uh, and I, I guess as soon as somebody says that to you, you're. A, humble enough man with yeah, well 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 there's still work to be done and i know that, that that you you have ambition to do different things with that gym and and uh uh i i'm still very impressed at what, what you've done so far and what's what's been lovely for me to hear is that that uh, at the center of it is is uh, a very simple concept of just uh, as we said a moment ago just creating a place where, where people are enjoying themselves which seems very simple at heart but what i think that this hopefully has done is allowed people to to understand a couple of things, one of which is that if you have that dream 
And it's a big dream, isn't it? To look at something like that and think, can I do this? And then you, you open it up even further and you find all these things that you've said were actually, maybe these aren't things you've even thought of, you know, financially it's an issue. You have to, uh, you know, think of so many things that, uh, it can be daunting enough for people just to give up, but your success and, and the, uh, the, the opportunity you've created for others kind of is a, is a nice, uh, opportunity to tell people, listen, if you just crack on, get your head down, do the homework, lean on others, lean on the experience that others might have and keep working keep positive, I suppose, as, uh, as, as trite as that sounds, um, then you can be in a position, as you've described, where, where uh, you, uh, it seems like you're pretty happy with what you've done so far. For sure. Yeah, we needed that positivity in 2020. That's for sure. Mate, mate. Difficult, yeah. How did that go for <laughs> you then? I know uh, I was kind of, kind of keen to wrap up in a certain sense and, and allow you the opportunity just to give us your final thoughts on it. But uh, I guess people probably would be thinking the same as me. What did you do? You said you, said you, you, you pivoted and, and, and you leaned in. I know, I know that uh, having chatted to you during that time, you leaned in hard to the online stuff, but it must have been very difficult uh, because presumably you, you, you had to keep up some kind of turnover in terms of rates and money and things coming through in order not just to lose what you'd already started to build. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, we were, so without getting too much into detail, at the time, there was various levels of support for businesses. Mm -hmm. um, however, they were only for businesses of, of certain sizes. So yeah. we were lucky to just kind of like fall within that that remit, if that's the right word. Yeah. Um, and there were things that were put into place like business rates, holidays, that kind of thing. So we just about managed to cover the majority of our costs through that. We didn't have to worry about any necessary operational costs because the gym wasn't allowed to be open. Um, yeah. But I think most importantly, what we did do was, so you still have your clients there. They still they still want to train. They understand it there that you know, you're in the predicament that you're in. You can't open the gym. That means they can't come to the gym. So you just have to kind of, for lack of a better way of explaining it, kind of take charge and just say, right, the game has changed somewhat, but the service that we're going to provide is still as much as the same as we can. So we do like Zoom personal training sessions. Yeah. A lot of clients would have um kit at home. Um, and I think really if you say, look, you know, we're we're just gonna do the the best possible job that we can, make them aware that you're there for them. Um, that was that was the thing that kind of got us through it, really. Um, and then for some people you might pivot onto kind of fully online. So you might be offering them just training programs to do. Some people might have um, gone on to do different activities. And I think we we briefly touched upon it in in the last podcast that you kind of had me as a guest on where a lot of people did kind of change their activities. So they become more interested in cycling because the roads were quieter sure, yeah, or running yeah. and that kind of thing. Um, so you'd be there for them to support that process as well. So yeah, yeah. It's, it was literally just the case of, it was all too easy to fall into a bit of a state of depression and be like, do you know what? Fuck this. The the world's kind of uh, going to shit. It's all falling apart. But actually, you know, there's there's some positives to be had and still a way that you can deliver your service, even if it isn't what you primarily intended to do. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I saw that happening for you. And, and, and it was, again, you know, I, I, I like to do this, but when, when, when you lean into the the the, the, um, the joy of it and you lean into to what it is that you're trying to do for people, ultimately, I mean, we want, we want to make a living, we want to make a comfortable living, but uh, if you lean into the fact that what you were going to lose there potentially was the opportunity, as you said a moment ago, to, to provide a service, but you found a way, you, you found a way to say, listen, we, we can keep you moving, we can, we can facilitate what it is that you want. Uh, and, and we can probably find a way to work together through that. And I think just having that will is probably enough to, to kind of where there is a will, there is a way and all, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I'm glad that you found your way through, but it seems like uh, you found yourself through well. Uh, now you have an online presence as well and people know how to find you in that sense. You've had the opportunity to, uh, as a business, look at different ways of operating. Uh, and then once those doors open back up again, those people were obviously very keen to come back in and spend time with you, which is fantastic isn't it yeah precisely i think that's an important thing to mention as well is if you'd have in uh march 2020 when it all kicked off if you'd have just kind of said i'm out they yeah. probably wouldn't have come back no, <laughs> no, say, how, being able to like actually help out and nurture those clients was massively important well during that time 
we'll, we'll, we'll cut this short really because we could get into pandemic conversations and stay here all day. But during that time, it became very important for people to know that they had some something that they could be accountable to, something that was actually sort of joyful outside of, of, of this kind of closed off, somewhat imprisoned environment that everybody found themselves in and uh, training uh, and uh, and that kind of work was something that people leaned in heavily to, you know, in actual fact. So if you're able to say, listen, we'll find a way to do it, then then people are keen to listen. So I'm, I'm, pleased, you, I'm pleased it worked out for you. That's good to hear. So yeah, for sure. Thanks, mate. I think with uh, uh, regards to owning your own facility in this kind of bricks and mortar situation that you've got, if we can cover off some of the notes that you were actually uh, kind enough to send me in the first place, um, just so we can kind of hit the bullet points at the end before we go, James. I think uh, understanding what your niche is, correct, is something that's very, very important. Where do I sit in the marketplace? What am I actually delivering, I suppose, is, 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 the, is a key. Uh, once you understand that, uh, you're going to have to make sure that you understand the costs, correct? You're going to have to understand what it is that you, you have to afford. Uh, and this comes right back down to, to the takeaway of the day, as we all now know what an, account, uh, uh, an acoustic surveyor is. So you need so to understand you say one, those one thing away, exactly, it's that. It's that, it's that yeah. yeah. <laughs> understand those costs. Uh, understand that the ongoing costs after that can probably be higher than you think. You mentioned business rates. You mentioned other, other kind of things that, that might seem more administrational that it's worth getting ahead of uh, as early as possible. Getting guidance, mentorship leaning into people that, that have the, perhaps the network that, that the landlord had, other people that may have opened their gyms that you can lean into and, and, and talk to those people and just learn and don't be afraid to ask questions. Sure. Uh, and and uh, I think one, one of the last notes, which doesn't quite fit in, in, in chronologically there, but uh, is, is making sure that you understand that the kind of turnover and, and, and uh, people will come and people will go. And I know you mentioned a moment ago that uh, you might inspire them to open their own business, which ultimately means that, that uh, you lose them from your business, but uh, such is the such is the nature of that flow. Uh, understanding that ahead of time uh, creates that kind of buffer for disappointment, I think. And you, you mentioned earlier on, you also know that you have gifted them the opportunity to kind of develop and grow it, it, it in their own right. So there's got to be some some pleasure comes from that. Exactly. Anything, anything else you can think of that I've missed from, from, from my notes that you think is a key highlight here that we need to clatter around people's heads before we say cheerio? I mean, we've made plenty of other mistakes and learned a lot of other lessons, but I think that's, uh, that ticks off the main ones, I think. That's enough to be going on with then. I think okay. so. I think so. So uh, at the end of the last uh, uh, podcast that, that we had you on, uh, we asked you where to find you. We'll do that again. Uh, but uh, where, where did people find you? Um, the, the, your, your gym in, in Seven Oaks, how, how do people find you directly? Sure. So you can go on to formtraining.co.uk where you can find our website, got information about both of the gyms there, the services that we offer, or you can follow us on Instagram. We are at form Seven Oaks and that's Seven Oaks, the words rather than number seven and Oaks. <laughs> okay. Just to uh, be we'll clear. That, yeah. Yeah. We'll put that in the show notes as well. So people can find you. Uh, and also, at JB Highbar uh, for you directly. Um, and uh, I think last time you were kind enough to give your, your email address. Let's hope that wasn't spammed out because of it. But I think we'll do that again, which is james at jamesblanchard.co.uk. That's the one um, well remembered. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not difficult. It's just your name over and over. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's if, without you know anything else to do, it's, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on again, mate. I, I really appreciate your time. Uh, people can also find you uh, through Omnia. Uh, you, we're, we're very, very uh, privileged to have you as a coach uh, with us at Omnia. So if people want to dig into that kind of side of things, then then, then please hit you up. Uh, so, James, thanks so much for coming on, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks for having me. Cheers, Johnny. Cheers, mate. Cheers.